Welcome everybody to Let's Talk Random Archaeology Episode 7 yeah. with myself, Professor Howard Williams and me, Afna Leseldin. Hello. And today we're going to be talking about my doctoral thesis a little bit about um, early Anglo-Saxon mortuary practices and the study of cremation in past societies. Um, cremation, yeah, that type of thing. Type of stuff about death, as usual. Um, as but usual. Over to Afnan for rationale. Yeah, well, I I just thought that as interested um, as I am in you, um, I also think that your followers, your listeners and your like, you know, subscribers are also interested in you. You have so many students and, you know, peers that I'm sure want to know your background and you're always on the other side of it. So I thought that today um, you should have the opportunity to, you know, be the one to talk about yourself. Um, so I hope you're all excited because I know I am Ooh, um, excited. Yeah. So first, I really just kind of want to keep it light. I I want I don't want to um, kind of, you know, tear your PhD apart. Not that I can. Um, but um, at first, I just want to let I want you to let us know. Um, so tell me about why you specifically chose this topic as your PhD. Why did you choose a PhD? I mean, like, um, and what even kind of got you on that road to start? Um, so quite a few questions there. So like, yeah, please, whenever, <laughs> whichever question you feel for, you feel like you want to answer, go take it away. Thanks, Afton. Well, I suppose I started uh, my career in archaeology as an undergraduate student at Sheffield and I jumped to do the MA. I did a BSc archaeological science. Then I jumped to do the MA burial archaeology at the University of Reading, which was a exciting, uh, distinctive yeah. MA that uh, involved teaching from um, Dr. Bob Chapman, now Professor Bob Chapman, and then uh, Dr. Now Professor Heinrich Herker and Professor Richard Bradley and others, but also um, sociologists such as Dr. Now Professor Tony Walter, uh, who was then at Reading but moved to Bath and set up the Centre for um, Death and um, the Death Studies or Death and Society there. Um, so, you know, sociology perspectives and there were sort of historians like uh, Dr. Ralph Holbrook um, also teaching at Reading at the time. So there's a whole interdisciplinary feel about death studies um, yeah. at Reading. And while I was mainly within archaeology, um, it was good to be part of that broader um, humanities and social sciences wide interest yeah. in mortality. Um, and um, I did my MA thesis on um, the early Anglo-Saxon reuse yeah. of the historic and Roman structures in the landscape of southern and eastern Britain. Uh, and um, during that time, um, Heinrich, who was my primary supervisor, um, said, am I interested in doing a PhD? And I said, yes. And we applied for funding and I got the funding and I started on it. And the topic was selected through a mixture. I must admit, it wasn't fully my idea. It was a, it was okay. a encouraged by Heinrich because Heinrich had done his very influential work at Oxford and then at Reading on early Anglo-Saxon weapon burial. And he had a recently fe finished doctoral researcher, uh, Dr. Nick Studley, working on the female gendered burial assemblages of the 5th to 7th centuries. But all of their work, both Heinrich and Nick's work, had been on the inhumation graves, on the unburnt burials. And no one oh. had done a systematic analysis across the country <coughs> on the cremation burials of early Anglo-Saxon England. And um, there was a um, 1980s piece of um, computer archaeology, comp um, a quantitative analysis done by um, now Professor Julian D. Richards um, okay. uh, on um, the, the urns that the cremated dead remains were put into and their decoration and form, um, but nothing subsequent. Now, halfway through my PhD has happened, I came across the fact that there was a, um, a researcher at Cambridge, Dr. Mads Raun, um, um, who was also doing a similar piece of work to me, but looking only at Spong Hill, the big cremation cemetery in Norfolk. But he wasn't looking beyond that. So there was still room for doing a systematic analysis of early Anglo-Saxon cremation burial. And so steered by the fact that Heinrich and Nick had been working on the inhumations, um, they encouraged me to look at the cremations. And indeed, as I started work on the topic, it was quite clear that this was a gap, that while um, Catherine Hills and her students at Cambridge we're continuing to work on Spong Hill, the, the biggest excavated early Anglo-Saxon cremation um, um, assemblages, over almost 2,500 burials um, and a, a few inhumations as well. <clears throat> um, there was no one else looking at the broader picture. 
And um, so I, I took that on as my topic. And so it came from a mixture of building off the MA, building off my undergraduate interest in burial archaeology and trying to do a thesis that filled a gap in existing research areas. But it wasn't my first choice of theme. I had wanted to continue working on monument reuse in the early Anglo-Saxon landscape. But I was also aware that there was an ex a doctoral researcher, now Professor Sarah Semple, who was Oxford doing that. And so it, it seemed natural to leave that topic at MA. I published, I wrote some publications during my doctoral years on that topic, on my MA thesis, maybe published in places like Medieval Archaeology and World Archaeology. And um, but I, I focused on a new topic and it was cremation in the fifth, sixth centuries AD. OK, because well, I from, I don't know why, but I always assumed that your PhD was like as your student, I always assumed that your PhD was something that you chose. So that's really interesting that I mean, I guess while you did kind of adopt that, um, it wasn't specifically and directly your your own idea. So how did you feel about like because I guess for me, when I write my assignments and when I did my work, it was very much that, oh, well, I'm interested in this. And I want to write about that. And it kind of came from a place of like, oh, no, I'm, I'm very interested in this. So how did it kind of come about that? How did you feel about doing a PhD that wasn't specifically or exactly what you wanted to do? Well, I mean, I, I should say it, it specifically exactly was at one level what I wanted to do because I was absolutely fascinated with early medieval archaeology and particularly early Anglo-Saxon archaeology and burial archaeology. So in many ways, it ticked all the boxes of what I was interested in. But on another level, the the topic and how it fitted into existing research at Reading and elsewhere was not my own um, suggestion. It was Heinrich's suggestion. And it was a good suggestion, but it it was it took a long time for me to while that helped me and I got the funding. <laughs> yeah, it took important. a long time for me. Yeah, it took a long time for it to settle and for me to gain ownership of the topic. Yeah. And partly that was a failing of Heinrich's and mine, too, because in combination, because it was Heinrich had been working on inhumation graves, which have a particular set of methods and theories associated with them, many of which don't work when applied to the much more fragmentary, much more difficult to interpret cremation material, cremated material. And where the osteological work is not as advanced and not as, 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 as reliable because of the damage, the fragmentation, the shrinkage, the, 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 mm. the, the, um, the, the discoloration and the distortion to um, human and animal bone when cremated uh, meant yeah. that, you know, we have lots of other challenges, taphonomic and ritual technology interpretive challenges to how we interpret the material but also we're not seeing the dead we're not seeing the moment where people are laying them in the grave with objects we're trying to deal with a much more complex multi-stage process and while inhumation funerals could have been complex multi-stage processes too um the cremation practices are much more difficult to comprehend apprehend and interrogate and therefore i think heinrich struggled with thinking he just thought i'd just create a big database and the the patterns <laughs> pop out yeah. and it, it became quite clear that that was not a realistic um expectation of my work and so a lot of my anxiety and struggles with the thesis came from trying to map you know get to a point where i understood what questions i can be asking yeah to approach the data in a way that doesn't simply create poor quality versions of the data that could be available to inhumation graves because of the in other words to think through what are the questions we can ask of this material yeah and okay. what and then how can we go about it and i felt that there was there was a real deficit in the existing work that no one had thought about this before they thought they'd always thought that well we can apply the same symbolic and social approaches to cremation as we can to inhumation or they'd said oh there's no point in looking at cremation and that's why everyone had avoided it so I think though both of those stances were not viable as starting points and so I needed to almost take well one two three four steps back from the data collection and analysis of the uh, and to ask more broadly what do we do with the cremated dead as archaeologists how do we approach 
cremated human material? How do we understand it? And so I actually had to spend a lot of time arguing with my supervisor and arguing with myself, trying to struggling with myself, so to speak, not really arguing, but struggling with what am I doing this? What am I, what, what's this about? How can I approach a data a, a database? Yeah. I don't even know what questions I'm trying to ask because I don't I don't think anyone's really set me up. So I had to sort of carve a new theoretical space, a new yeah. methodological space and a new comparative analogical space looking at sociological, historical and ethnographic material before I could then do my analysis. And therefore, this changed the nature of the thesis quite markedly. And I spent a lot of time wasted um, on, you know, dead ends and struggling through materials and learning a lot as I went, but struggling yeah. through materials that were not as directly on my core early Anglo-Saxon burial literature. So, yeah, uh, that was, I suppose, the difficulty of taking up a topic that someone else thought was a good idea. And I thought, yes, I think that's a good idea, too. And then realising I've taken on more than anyone else and I, I myself had, had tackled before. And so it was, it was a real challenge. I think this is not a unique problem. This is um, what I've just described is, I think, a problem many doctoral researchers find. And they're given a title and a topic area and very quickly they find themselves theoretically and methodologically struggling to yeah. work out how they do what they're expected to do and um, to meet the expectations of what the the thesis proposal that they, you know, I'd written the proposal, you know, from a suggestion. Someone, it's not, it's not as if someone else wrote the proposal, got the money for me. I had to apply for it. I got the, made the yeah. proposal. And yet I set myself up to then do that. And I was going, holy cow, how am I going to do this? <laughs> Given the quality and character and challenges of the data available. Uh, many of the sites had not been published or partially published. Many of the sites had not osteolog had no osteological evidence associated with them. Oh, I see. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you feel like after getting all of that, um, well, actually not after getting the data, after being presented with the situation at hand, you did you feel like, OK, well, maybe this is kind of like your way into feeling as if this topic was more your specialty and you kind of felt, OK, well, I actually did something yeah. for this topic how did you I think I I mean I my subsequent publications and the thesis itself and the subsequent publications that came after that make the case um but at the time most of the PhD I spent feeling that this was not good enough this was going nowhere this was a waste of my time everyone else's time and um it was only I took an extra year to finish and it was only when I sent the final draft to Heinrich and um he said, you know, this actually is quite good. <laughs> and I went, good. I, I, and it was only at that point I thought, well, maybe I've saved it. And it was actually really at, at, in the last three months of the fourth year with a oh. final deadline that was immovable that I had to meet um, or Reading would basically have removed me from their PhD books because they oh. um, and this happens if you don't complete in time. Um, did I realise that I had the thesis? I had the thesis. I had the arguments um, in place. And so for three years and nine months, I felt I didn't have a thesis worth anyone's time. That's really interesting, actually, because like, I, like we've already said, so having read through what I've read, it really doesn't come across that way at all. Um, I feel like you you had a very clear sight of what you wanted to do. Um, right from the start so that's actually a very interesting uh it's new information for me and I'm actually really surprised and I think like I don't know maybe it's just your writing style that I admire but who knows part um, of it's bad planning part of it is poor confidence part of it is dealing with but a large part of it is dealing with a complex problem that is trying to innovate on theoretical methodological and data analysis level simultaneously if you're doing a thesis that builds on someone else's theories and methods and applies it to a new data set or if you're trying to carve a new theory and then just go oh and here's some data and you're not doing a data analysis as well then I think you've got challenges but you've got challenges at least on one front but I think I found myself fighting sort of on multiple stages and, and in multiple multiple perspectives and I found that was particularly um challenging for me I think other different personalities different supervisory teams different individuals abilities would have made 
quicker work with this. But for me, honestly, I would say for most of my time as a doctoral student, I felt I wasn't going anywhere and it wasn't working out. It wasn't the thesis wasn't there. And I, but then also I find a lot of students say the same to me, too. Yeah, now it's done. I kind of OK with it. But for most yeah. of that j- journey, I felt like I was in a dark tunnel and there was no there was no light. I had a plan. I had a structure. I had my own targets that I was either failing to meet or partially meeting. But honestly, and it's not about, oh, you know, people should have encouraged you more. And, oh, you had other. I had other PhD students who were feeling the same, but others that supported me. I had friends. I had my supervisors were. I was I was intolerably bad as a student and they were very good as supervisors. I don't think it was their failing. I think it's more just really difficult to see the the wood from trees and all these other cliches, all these other metaphors. It's really right. difficult to see. I've got eight chapters here. I'm looking at my physical copy of my draft thesis now. While Excellent. I'm it. And it looks coherent, but it, t- it took a long time to get to that. Okay. Do you feel like that kind of experience really kind of set you up for like um, being in the position that you are now, like being such a, a well-known author, editor, writer, I mean, it gives me confidence to realise that it is it never goes away, that sense of uncertainty, that sense of uh, futility, the sense of, um, you know, of, of academia is a mixture of well-intentioned, well-planned exercises and winging it at the last minute to make it make sense, um, because um, that is the nature of most academic life, I think. So, yes, I did set me up and it was a trial by fire that I never want to go through again. And no one wants to really live, relive their doctoral years. Of trying to work out what are the key questions and what are the questions you think are important but are not really that exciting and not going to change the world and i'm still living with the fact that i never published the thesis as a thesis you can download it from the british library it's yeah. a free free to access now um i'm not proud of all of it there's obviously presentational issues there's structural issues there's there's half-baked arguments and but there's also some really good stuff in there that i've never I've never really picked up until right, well, I'm doing a piece on a bit of it now. Um, but but a lot of it is now out in various publications and journal articles, book chapters, you know, build it. But, but in much more advanced versions, things that where well, I was had an opportunity to qualify and extend and expand and revise what I did. So I'm still proud. I'm proud of the thesis after uh, 20, 22 years because I got it in 2000. It was supposed to be submitted in 1999. But I did I did it a year late. I had an extra year and I submitted 16th, 16th of October 2000 and was examined, I think, in November, December 2000. Uh, my external was Julian D. Richards of York University and the internal was Richard Bradley. Um, and both both of these examiners, you know, gave me, I got minor corrections. I probably deserve majors, but minors was what I got. And I got the, got the thesis, but I uh, got the doctoral award. But my point would be it, it, it takes a long time to. Um, process the achievements and I think I'm proud of it but uh, equally it's a thesis with many limitations and flaws uh, uh, but that that's true of all theses I feel. Mm. Yeah I mean like I, I haven't done one myself but I always assume that of course being having a PhD or doing a PhD sets you up um, for a, a better future in the academic s- sphere um, but you're still a student at the end of the day. You're still learning and it's still yeah. like, I guess, a process that you have to kind of go through. Um, I'm just, it's just really interesting to kind of hear your your points. Well, how, well, your experience, I guess, is what I'm trying to say about um, doing it. Because as a student, I never get that sense from you where it's like, I don't know. I didn't know what I was doing. I don't know what in particular or I don't know where it's going I, suppose, I guess I, I suppose some people um some lecturers they have their thesis the thesis becomes their first monograph mm. and it's almost like it's their first hit record type and to use an <laughs> analogy it's like that's the thing that they're they're known for but yeah. the way I constructed my career subsequently was to set th- four or five different prongs of research up only one or two of them came from the thesis once continued from the master's and two or three, actually, so multi, many part prongs. Others de- I developed from stra- scratch towards my first monograph in 2006, my first and only monograph, actually, in 2006. And I found a lot of my, I found it much more flexible and easy to work on book chapters and journal articles rather than working towards books as end results. And 
given the nature of my career and the range of things I've been doing, that, that, that suits me better. And different disciplines and different individuals within discipline take different approaches. Um, um, and I, I, I found um, a monograph is a stifling framework in which to produce research. And often monographs are out to date before, while, before they're even published because they take so long to produce. Whereas journal articles allow you to synthesize ideas into five to 10,000 words and yeah. to articulate those ideas in a, in a particular venue for particular audiences in a way that monographs can't. So I've, I've worked that way. Um, so I've, the thesis at one level I left behind quite rapidly. At another level, I've kept going for over 22 years, publishing bits and elements of it, and building off it um, yeah. to build a career. So yes, at one level, I am the thesis. Another level, I'm not the thesis because I'd never allowed the thesis to become my flagship my my signature work my the catchy tune that everyone knows because I, I didn't want it to be that I wanted my I wanted my career to be not not have that as the the be all and the end all but uh, every academic has a different relationship with their thesis some scholars I know just the thesis is done and the last thing that's the last thing they'll ever publish on and they'll leave it there they, they did the work they got the qualification they achieved the result but they know they don't want to pursue it to any further degree but um, my, my view was I took elements out of it and built, augmented them and extended them towards publications. But the thesis itself has never seen the light of day as a book. And I think that's probably for the best. Although a few people have said, oh, it's a pity you didn't produce it as a book. Uh, yeah. You know, actually, I think I think the problem is, and this is another admittance, a lot of the theories and ideas I was developing um, needed seven, eight scholars to really develop. You know, they, it was his idea. I didn't have expertise in the old English or the the anthropological material to take them forward in a way. Um, um, and so, you know, I was setting up work for more people rather than work that I could ever finish. Uh, and some people have taken it forward and built on my work. Um, others have ignored my work. This is what happens in academia. But my point is that, um, you know, uh, I think it's a bit, it's not always about oneself it's about trying to contribute to a field a research topic uh, a debate and it's not therefore always important to have the last word uh, it's about setting up questions that other people can then take forward and and, and develop upon even if you assert something that it proves to be utterly unfounded or utterly partial 10 years mm -hmm. later your work is still influential in leading people down that direction even if what you know, they say is no longer something that you know you agree with or what you said is something that they um subsequently dismiss so it's it's not not necessarily about it standing forever as a monolithic work it's about contributing to a field of research and taking things forward Absolutely. so yeah it's 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 uh i'm proud of it um in some ways but i'm i, I cringe at it in others you know i hardly <laughs> ever look at it so it's really weird to have it in front of me looking through this as we talk <laughs> um, do you but, think that oh yeah go on Oh no! I was gonna say, do you think like, um, because you said that when you started it, it was it was kind of a gap in the archaeological like I guess landscape. Um, and do you feel like you've done the job that you wanted to do by introducing it to the archaeological landscape? So in terms of the eight chapters, um, the first chapter is on the historiography and theory of cremation in early Anglo-Saxon England. And I think I've trans that chapter and the publications that came out of that have made a real input impact um, uh, um, on our understanding and the the anthropological and sociological approaches of chapter four then leading into the analysis of the distribution of cremation in chapter five the mm -hmm. the, the structures and cemetery context of chapter six and then the mortuary analysis of, of variability in the burial rites in chapter seven have made a major contribution but but my my chapters two and three about medieval lit history and literature and and mm. particularly chapter three looking at Beowulf and um, the relation Beowulf is something I've never picked up until now and I'm working on now a little bit about the um, how I think there has been a, a confusion and neglect of um, the poem Beowulf uh, <laughs> because in because no one is literate in oh the yeah. theory and method of cremation um, research in anthropology, sociology and archaeology when approaching that funerary account. And so I'm happy to be working with a, um, a colleague on a, potent, on a possible book, uh, journal article, sorry, um, evaluating 
the be- the funeral of Beowulf, uh, who is cremated after slaying the dragon, are on a headland and a burial mound is constructed. I'm trying to consider that from the perspective of what I'd written in t- year 2000. Um, so that is no one. I haven't seen anyone else do that in the way that I, I'm intending to do it with collab- a collaborator, because it's something I, I don't have the skills as an old English. I'm not an old English scholar. So I'm I'm working with someone else to do that work. So in some ways, I feel I've achieved and made the impact. Made the impact. In other, in other ways, I'm still working on some of these topics. Yeah. OK, because it is it is quite fascinating as I was reading through. It, and unfortunately, I didn't I didn't finish all of it. It's a very long piece. Um, <laughs> um, while very interesting, definitely, like I got up to like quite a few chapters in and I don't know, like it is, it is very interesting because it seems like now that you're talking about it, it feel it feels like you are happy to kind of pick and choose the stuff that you've ri- like already written about, but it doesn't seem to be like, I guess, systematic in a way. So it's like the first time you're looking at it in such a long time. So this stuff is still on your mind. Yes. So do you feel like this PhD has, well, I guess, just constantly just been sitting there? This like, oh, well, I wrote about this, but I haven't picked up on it yet. No one has. So I, I should. Well, I've been I've been seeing obviously the other publications and the other work researchers who have uh, mm. been working on this topic subsequently, such as Dr. Gareth Perry, uh, Dr. Kirsty Squires, and I'm working on a new edited collection with uh, Femke Lipok Lipok of uh, Leiden University, looking at cremation in early medieval Europe, and we're looking with an edited collection, that, and that's a new piece of work, which is very much an extension of my thesis, but something that I makes the point I you know reflects on the point I made earlier that. I set up an area of research that I could never do myself. I've been watching and reading other researchers tackle these things since. So I'm, I was never, so it hasn't gone away because I've been learning how I was right, how I was wrong, how my ideas are being critiqued and evaluated over the last 20 plus years. Um, yeah. But also I'm coming back to that now with this new edited book project to draw in this new research to say, well, where are we now? What are we up to now? What are the new questions? Now we've got, um, ancient DNA. Now we've got stable isotope analysis. Now we've got sort of more work being done on the pyre technologies and the um, the the charcoal data. You know the plant remains from the you know, how yeah. we can. You know, there's a whole series of new questions. Um, mm. So it's it's not that my thesis is redundant, uh, but my thesis is 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 has continued to be actively interacting with these uh, new researches. Are through, and not simply for early Anglo-Saxon England, but people working on early medieval uh, or late Iron Age uh, Finland yeah. or um, Norway or Sweden or um, the Netherlands. And so it's really interesting to see how many of the questions I asked are still being asked by researchers. Others, they're taking it into very different directions because we've got new methods and new ways of looking at the material and new excavations are, are finding fascinating new results. So um, in many ways, it's this weird mixture of plus a change. Nothing, nothing really has moved on. The questions I asked in 2000 are still relevant today, but there are also these other new exciting areas of research uh, that are um, coming out. And of course, one of the other aspects I'm interested in, as you know, is the public engagement. That how, do, how does this work filter through to the public sphere? Does any of it filter through to the public sphere? Or are we still working on 19th century tropes of what cremation in the early Middle Ages was considered to be? And it's really interesting to see that some of my research has informed museum displays from the British Museum and elsewhere um, to see how cremation is being mentioned more in museum and heritage contexts, uh, but perhaps still far from being adequately articulated for the public to understand. Um, so having just come back from a, seeing the re-envisaged uh, Sutton Hoo exhibitions uh, yeah. in, in, in Suffolk at the National Trust site, um, I was interested to see how during the lockdown they've, re- they've overhauled the display and they have a few more mentions of cremation, uh, but, you know, you really don't get a sense of it. Anyway, that, so my point is there's still work to be done, but, but yeah. it's evolving and emerging and, and developing field. Um, so yeah it's I think yeah I mean I'm I'm of course fascinated um in in your work and I'm always like because for me it really does feel like every piece of work that you write or everything that you like prepare for comes out and it kind of shows it's an improvement 
in the archaeological sphere, whether it sparks a debate or whether people just like agree with you and take it for face value. So do you feel like, I mean, this might be a very um, personal question, but would you consider yourself successful in your PhD? Because I know that you, you said it took a year longer and you were a bit worried about that, but you've, you're very successful now. And how do you feel like your PhD set you up for that or <laughs> sorry you look it's a really difficult one to know isn't it because mm -hmm. um at one level the reason I got my job as a, a lecturer in archaeology which I, the reason I was a year late was because I, I got an, a lectureship before I'd finished the PhD yeah. so you could make the argument that the, the content of my PhD did not get me my career my publications yeah. from my master's thesis my active research network my performance at a job interview that showed I could teach um, got me my career in academia. Excellent. That, <laughs> to say that would really piss off a lot of people. So you can say, so what, you know, because you, you know, the assumption is your PhD, and if you talk a lot to a lot of academics, they they do talk as if their PhD somehow is so important to their identity and their career. You know, that uh, such an important piece of work. Oh yes. You know, and you, you see, uh, particularly my history colleagues, it's hilarious. They're so, but, but also archaeologists too. But so some of the way they talk about their thesis is, yeah, is immediately pompous. Uh, one, what I'm trying to say at one level is that it, it didn't really matter what I wrote in the thesis as long as I got the qualification. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's pretty good. Um, but of course, in reality, if I couldn't have followed up with an active research profile building on my MA and yeah. to my PhD whilst being busy as a lecturer, then my career would have perhaps faltered at an early stage. And I knew, do know people who got their PhD, but they've got nothing to say from the PhD. They've got nothing to deliver. They may get a postdoc and they may work on someone else's big research project, but they've got no voice. They've got no ideas. They've got no. So at one level, I'm trying to say the PhD at one level didn't make my career. Yeah. Another but, level, I'm saying it absolutely gave me the foundation of realising the strengths and weaknesses of my, uh, the, the, the successes and failures um, set me up for how to drive my research forward. I don't know if that's contradictory, but I, that's the way I feel about it anyway. Is okay. that, you know, at one level, the thesis wasn't, didn't make me, you know, in fact, it broke me more than they made me. Um, <laughs> but, but, but from it, from the ashes, the cremation ashes of the thesis, I was able to extract and re regenerate a, a career um, once I was in a lectureship. Um, so what? Yeah, I'll, I think that's all I can say. I know. I think that's really great because, like you said, and I think like that's the way that kind of the majority of academics or I guess pros pros prospering, prospering, prospering academics. Yeah, <laughs> as, as I'm thinking, is that the right word? See, this is my, uh, I always get so worried when I talk with you because like, I feel like you're always still on such a, on such a pedestal for me and I can't like, re yeah. But anyways, um, <laughs> um, I think that a lot of academics or like, you know, students who wish to be academics in the future, they always think, well, I know I need to get it. It's an order. You do your bachelor's, you do your master's, you get your PhD, then you get a job. And I guess like that's the route. But it's very interesting because for you, it it really wasn't like that. And I and I kind of like that your PhD isn't what made you into who you are today, because really, and like from what I've read of your books, not just recently, but before, um, and what you're saying now about how it a lot of it stemmed from your master's and how it's just attitude and the will to do more research and the will to kind of actively be a part of the archaeological community that really can strike you a good deal. And maybe people say it's luck, but maybe some people can just say that, you know, you were just, you had the skill for it. I think the important thing is to say that there's an incredible number, and it's worse now than it ever was in 20 years ago, there's an incredible number of talented people, an incredible number of bright minds and yeah. very few jobs and I would not say there's anything special about me other than I did beat other people. If you want to see it that way, I did beat other people who are very well regarded now to my first lectureship. It wasn't. And I, I, I won my positions and kept my positions moving forward, you know, um, 
with stiff competition, but nothing like the ridiculous levels, the intense competition that there are today. Uh, and I know I was lucky. Um, and my point is that I don't think there's any formula. But I think one thing I would say is don't put all your eggs in one basket. This, this, this yeah. Yes, there is a structure. Yes, there are hoops to jump through. But I think you, some we can be much more canny as academics in not tying ourselves to one idea, one approach. It's not just about immediately disowning every idea that you've got, you've finished, but it's about realising that was a piece of work you did. It got as far as it did. if people like it or they don't like it, it's always just a bonus. You know, I'm not making any money out of my publications. I'm not making any friends out of them, certainly. But, you know, it, the fact is if some people like them, fine. If they don't, they don't. But then you're moving on to the next piece of research and you can't I will defend my past research and I will defend my reputation and but equally if people disagree with me and have good grounds to um, counter or critique what I say that's 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 what we're about too that's what that's part of the process um, I've seen I you know over the years I've seen criticisms of my work and um, some of them have been valid some of them are valid in the sense of yeah those are things I could should have done differently then there was the valid in terms of now we know that I did it it, we know we know we know better so to speak and um then there are the criticisms that you think nah you're just nitpicking you yeah or oh, uh, you know or you're mischaracterizing what i said i never did say the way things in the way you did and um i, th I think you know but I, I there's no point in I, I would never defend things i wrote 20 22 years ago as gospel there's nothing that i have to have to defend but i do there are things that i see written about my work and i think ah, that's not i don't know, that's that's something they've imagined I said rather than something I actually said but yeah. sometimes it's worth defending most of the time though it's worth just going oh well life moves on uh, people can go and read it it's cited at least it's cited they can go read it and judge for themselves um, and uh, it's available and I've, I've tried to work to make my stuff as as readily available um, for those yeah. that can't afford access um, I've tried to work more and more with open access resources but also sharing uh, drafts of my work on Academia Edu and Humanities Commons so that you know my work is never paywalled um very little of my work is unavailable uh from the thesis right the way through and that's a principle that it's you know you've got to um at least if you're producing this work you're not i'm not making money from it it's it's about part of my career well i'm making money from it in the sense it's my career but i'm not i'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not i'm not but book sales or articles are not coming to me it's going to the publishers you know um yeah. but what i would say is that this 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 body of work needs to be have a legacy and whether it's a legacy that um you know i, I don't know whether in 10 years time i'll be cited at all because citations are so much down to the vagaries of fashion um but my point is i can i think i'm proud of what i've produced so far um, but yeah. I will be producing different things moving forward, and I'm not tied to defending things I wrote in the distant past. You know, life moves on. Definitely, and I think on that note of citations, like um, I'm, I'm pretty sure I've said this before during uh, one of our talks um, for my undergraduate. But it's very difficult to search for anything within the sphere of medieval archaeology or even anything remotely close to death and memory without your name popping up on Google Scholar. It's very, very difficult to kind of do that, <laughs> which oh. maybe mm, I don't know how you feel. I think it's a great thing because it's um, we were always questioned. Do you think it's going to get us extra points if we cite him in our in our work or not? <laughs> and we, we I guess it didn't. Of course, always. No, 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 no. I mean, it's, no, it's, it's about its own. Uh, I mean, I, I prefer I prefer uh, I encourage my students to critique and um, uh, in a rigorous way all the things they cite and uh, to cite things that are reliable and good. And if it, I, I would prefer they did that with other scholars as as um, rather than coming to my work. But if they have critical comments to make in my work, then that should go into their their writing. But I I think it's not about you know I, those pieces of work you know are out there they're they're available they are dated they're dated the second they're written they're dated probably before they're even published i've got pieces at the moment that are not, are not out yet you know they'll all be they're already dated and i've just had to update one piece that was um, already um was was um, had inaccuracies because of new results um yeah. you know all our work is time sensitive but we're not working in certain fields of sciences where a couple of months and a new virus and suddenly that work is all redundant uh, we are working where things do have a long shelf life, a digital shelf life, if not a physical shelf life. And I find people are still 
reading stuff that I wrote 20 years ago and still being valuable because whatever its weakness is it's not the crap that was written in the 1950s or the 1920s which is really what is still being a lot of stuff is being circulated about the early middle ages based on those Mm. kinds of thinking so yeah I mean um I don't know I, 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 I don't really focus too much on looking for citations of what I say I'm of no I do actually I do look at I look for where my ideas are being taken forward I, I focus yep. on that I don't look so much at where am I cited passively where am I just getting a citation I'm interested in what people are doing with the work I've done and I, I, I hope I hope that's um, a legacy um, that I can be proud of but you know Absolutely. at the end of the day that maybe the stuff that I'll be remembered for were, I've yet to write or maybe it was just some of the first conference articles I wrote as a postgraduate I don't know we'll have to that's not for me to judge though is it <laughs> no I mean yeah I guess not I just think it's of course it's important to see your citations go places whether it's from you know someone criticizing your PhD or going into the works that you've done nowadays um but I do find it very interesting that you are very open to criticism and you are you kind of almost welcome it um i'm not sure like i'm i'm not part of the archaeological landscape anymore i'm not part of the archaeological community anymore um but oh, i feel so sad to say that but <laughs> um it i do f- i get the feeling that a lot of other lecturers or a lot of other i guess authors editors wouldn't feel the same way so do you feel that because that's kind of like your goal almost I don't know if it's a goal but like you because you write a lot and you edit a lot and you produce a lot of work do you think it's because you want to like not just show interest in what you're interested in but I mean I guess have people maybe start a spark maybe have people disagree with you you're kind of looking for it you want that to happen you want the disagreement I, I certainly want the conversations. I don't necessarily yeah. want a disagreement, but I certainly want the dialogue and the, I want people to be inspired to move things forward in directions, either counter to what I'm suggesting or building on what I've suggested. I mean, it's, uh, I mean that's why I've worked, I've, I've spent so much effort putting in collaborative projects with students and uh, researchers and uh, other co- academics, both within my discipline and beyond my discipline, to create spaces and environments where new ideas can develop that aren't dependent mm-hmm. just on my particular take. So yes, yeah. obviously I bring my perspectives to topics inevitably. I bring my agendas, if you want to use that way, my 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 emphases, my 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 expertise, but I also try to raise up and foster those who are talented and who have things to say themselves or have different angles and and approaches. And that's why I put a lot of effort into collaboration. Um, I think I can't, I don't think, I, given how many edited collections and edited pro- collaborative projects I've done, I'm not sure I can sustain that moving forward. And I think I might be moving back back, back to much more work on my own. Not that I've yeah. ever worked just on my own, but more my single authored pieces, um, just so I can have a bit more control over what I produce and how I do it. But I think I, I, I think more than many scholars in my field, I have not being selfish in my time to ensure others have opportunities to um, develop their ideas and find and 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 get their ideas to publication both as an editor of journals as an editor of um, books on distinctive new themes I hope I've taken research forward in that regard rather than simply banging my own drum so to speak yeah and I mean like um as a person who's very like well, I mean, who was a part of that? I, I do feel like that is exactly what you do. You're a very encouraging person um, as a lecturer. And while maybe you came for me, come off as a little scary sometimes when I first met you, um, that really isn't the case. And I do really appreciate that. Like you, you are very encouraging when it comes to think on your own. Don't don't let somebody tell you what to think. And I think that's a very important part of archaeology. And that's been consider- so much. Yeah, please go on. I was just going to say, uh, uh, there's so much debate about gatekeeping and uh, in academia. And yeah, of course there's gatekeeping. And I think gatekeeping is essential. You know, gatekeeping in the sense of calling out bad ideas, challenging shoddy preliminary work. And I, I've had that done to me too. And I, I deserved it and asked for it in many occasions. But 
I, I'm not I'm, I don't want to be everyone. I, I don't think in academia, you, we're not here to be each other's best friends and to to agree with each other's ideas just because we're there. Yeah, yeah. Such a great idea. No, we're there to challenge and to, and to question each other. Um, but but um, it doesn't have to be about the person. It can be about the ideas. Um, yeah. And I think that's really important. Um, and it's part of not only being civil, but also you are basically creating a toxic environment which fails to foster new ideas and new approaches if the only ap approach you've got is to is to um, belittle and denigrate individuals so yes I, I am looking for dis discussion and disagreement but not about my personality but about all my but, but about <laughs> things I'm, I'm writing and about the kind of ideas I'm putting forward and, and I think that's really important for students to see and it's important to be role models in that regard for students to to see how you can have uh, have proper academic discussions without it turning into and that's your head that is or that's your face that is or you know <laughs> you know that empty coffee cup that's your thesis that is you know <laughs> there's kind of petty sort of kiddie arguments that uh, some academics seem to spend a lot of their time getting into um yeah i think it's important yeah and i know i know that you've um i, I totally forgot the word review you review other people's phds Yes, I'm an examiner of PhDs as well. And I've learned a lot in that process. I've done, I've done about 20 in the last 22 yeah. years. You know, I've, um, I've, I've, I'm an internal examiner, external examiner at a range of universities across the UK, uh, Scandinavia and the US and other places. I've been involved in theses and advisors as an advisor and an examiner. Yes, and I think that's an important part of what I do too. Um, yeah. I've learned how to do a thesis and the mistakes and I supervise my own students to completion and I examine others at other universities. So. It's all about sharing, sharing um, perspectives. And again, it's not I don't go into those examination roles as I'm going to stop them saying what they believe. It's about challenging their ideas, you know, identifying weaknesses in their arguments so that they can build and construct a much more convincing and coherent piece of research. Yeah, because I, I met a few of your PhD uh, students while I was at the university and I was actually wondering how would you, not to them, I guess, but to other PhD students who are looking to do a PhD in archaeology, who want to, you know, I don't know, do a PhD in any other subject, I guess, because um, it seemed like you didn't have a very easy, you know, an easy life, I guess, when it comes to doing your PhD. So what can you say yeah. what can you offer advice wise you see it's difficult isn't it because every phd is different and there's a lot of stories about abusive and negative relationships with phd supervisors yeah. uh, and a lot of gushing adoration for phd supervisors just because they were supportive okay <laughs> yeah i think that um i think there's a lot of very a lot of postgraduates are very intellectually naive and i certainly was Mm. Um, and I did mine. I, I, I think a lot of the problems I had were my fault, my doing, because I couldn't, and I had my own struggles with it. It wasn't the failings of my supervisors. And it doesn't matter. I would say that no matter how many training courses and and support sessions and you you might have um, during or any you know, and training for PhDs has got a lot better and a lot more structured. You are still basically on your own, and at some point, you if you're doing that kind of work you've got to you've got to own it and yeah. saying oh my supervisor wasn't sympathetic oh they looked at me funny there are some genuinely toxic nasty supervisors out there and I can't say I've always been the good guy I think I've been really quite you know really tough with some of my PhD students because mm -hmm. otherwise they wouldn't have got through but I, not, not personally abusive but you know but but you know I mean in terms of academically their ideas expecting yeah. more of them and I don't think your PhD supervisor will ever be your friend. And a good supervisor will be someone who challenges you, guides you, uh, and 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 disagrees with you. Yeah. Um, and the problem I think is a lot of a lot of PhD students don't know how to handle that. Yeah. And it's not easy. And I, I said so that. I, I mean, I mean, I'm applying that to myself. And it's not an easy process. I'm not saying you have to get tough and man up. I'm not, I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's a real really bespoke project everyone's is different where the relationships the personalities the ideas the theories the methods 
are, are, are really sensitive topics that become very personal. And it's it's so I, I don't have any single piece of advice other than um, you have to think carefully about where, how and what you want to do and who you want to do it with and why. <laughs> and okay. it, you cannot go into a PhD anticipating a career in academia, I'm afraid, especially in the humanities and social sciences where there are so few opportunities. And you have mm -hmm. to do it because you are the interest, the you know the experience, but also potentially it gives you insights and a career that may be outside of that discipline. You can't presume it'll lead you into an academic career. And that's a horrible thing to say. Uh, but I'm afraid um, it's just the reality of where we're at, I'm afraid. I see. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that's great because, I mean, I mean, it's not great, obviously, the fact that there are no there's no jobs in a sector that you want well, a job isn't great. Um, <laughs> well, that's why it's so hard with my union to to stop the casualization process of academia and to try and work for better conditions. I mean, that's why I feel so strongly about my younger colleagues getting opportunities and I get very angry when you know at the current situation in UK HE but also I, I would say uh, the other thing and uh, having said all that it is tough and it is difficult and don't expect it all to go well but having said that you have to be kind to yourself you have to be forgiving of yourself at every point on your journey in a PhD you have to remember no one else has done this before they yeah. yes, have done PhDs before but no one's done your PhD before. And this was said to me, actually. Now I only, only remember it now. I said it was said to me, or something like this was said to me by multiple people at Reading. Um, and I, I, I don't think I fully internalised it and took it, appreciated what was said. But I think that's it is very true. And it it's important that, you know, you are on a, a lone journey because it is a journey worth having. It's a journey worth taking you to a different place that no one else has been before to boldly go <laughs> it is uh, to use a star trek you know it is it is taking you into what's the point in going on a journey everyone else has been on um right. and that's well that's a horrible thing to say because because there's lots of reasons for going on journeys that other people have been on but sorry um in phd terms um yeah. so forget that analogy that, that analogy sucks and it's horrible but um my point is you've got to be forgiving of yourself if you need a break if you need to change tack if you need to you know it, it, it you cannot um you cannot be your own worst enemy of being your own uh drill sergeant you know d dictating yourself you've got to just give yourself a little bit of space and let other people and communication is something i failed to do if, like when i needed those guidance where i needed those breaks crucial moments in my phd where i think i could have saved myself a lot of grief and misery um if i just simply said i need guidance on two points help this is what i need help with i need it now and I never did it. And I think so communication and being forgiving of your supervisors, but also of yourself, I think is very important. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's really great advice, actually, because I think a lot of the time, I mean, I'm not a PhD student, but I think a lot of the time students don't feel like they can ask for help because one, it means they feel like it means that they can't do it themselves. It means that they they didn't accomplish what they came to accomplish or maybe it's they just exactly, didn't do it. Exactly. It's not, it's not, but it feels that way, you know? Yeah, uh, of course, it just feels that way. How do I open this jar? You know, I better keep just trying to open the jar, even if there's someone behind me in the kitchen who could easily open the jar. I'm not going to give them the opportunity because they'll just rub my nose in it. And no, no, it's not about that. It's about, look, literally, there are key points where you can save yourself a lot of grief if you just say, look, actually, I'm stuck. I don't know how to do this. Take and me. I think people forget that, like, that's what you're there for. Like, as as a lecturer, as a supervisor, and you, you're there to help. You're not. I mean, of course, you're there to criticize to a point to help you. It's helpful criticism. Um, it's not about, you know, oh well, you didn't do your research, so you know, go do some research and come back. Of course, sometimes that might be the case. Um, however, I do think that it kind of brings to like because what I just think is really important is that a lot of people kind of see for example you your success and where you are at the moment and they don't really think about how you kind of got there and it does take this tiny steps to get to where you are and of course it's nice coming from you to know that it's okay to ask for help if you need it because you know it's also really important to remember that I mean all the tensions I had with my supervisory team I also mm -hmm. had my back in ways that I never needed, but I might have needed. And um, I've, I can give you examples where yeah. I've been 
meetings I've had with PhD students at points in their research where it's been quite combative, but it's been combative within f disciplined and respected frameworks. It's not an argue, a shouting match. It's about, yeah. no, you need to look, you either do this or you do this or you do this, but you need to decide what you're doing or something like that. Um, but there's been other occasions where, and I want well, this has just happened with me, where my student has felt very upset about an issue. And mm. me as part of a supervisory team have been there to totally 100 percent agree with them and back them up and say, you know, Absolutely. it's not it's not you. This is rubbish. This is what this is not your failing. What you did was 100 percent correct. And we're backing you up. And I wouldn't do that unless I believed it. I wouldn't just support my student just out of some blind loyalty. But sometimes no. the students no. are facing issues within and beyond the university, which are not their fault. And yeah. they need that support. They need that mobilisation of. Of, of of influence and, and 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 support and guidance at points where they are not it's not a com it's not a conflict between the supervisor and the student it's a conflict with the the greater universe then <laughs> we're part of a team to face off against those 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 issues would be they small or big and maybe personal maybe financial but we can't we can't become we can't do everything about everything but we can be there for the student and that's important i think yeah definitely I think that's really great and I mean it sheds a lot of light on not just your PhD but PhDs in general and how like I guess the whole world's unfortunately against you so <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm very proud at the moment of PhDs and thinking about PhDs because tomorrow I have one of my students uh, my former doctoral researchers is graduating at Chester oh. Cathedral and next month another one is uh, so I've got two uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm it's gonna be a very proud moment for me uh, to to see them through to completion and uh, following on from others and uh, yeah a moment of celebration hopefully a bit of slap up food and uh, yeah <laughs> I hope so oh that sounds so awesome and congratulations I mean I know that it's it's hard work to I mean congratulations to them for succeeding in writing their PhDs of course but it's obviously not that easy to also um, guide someone through something as difficult as a PhD so I mean congratulations to you too and I'm sure you're feeling super proud about that as well that's great oh yeah yeah, yeah. it's almost like I've, I've, I've when they passed and they had the this but they both passed last year a few they're done but of course I haven't formally done the formal graduation yet and uh, you know they yeah. are they've got their theses but they've got to uh, you know it'd be lovely to have a, a ritual uh, procession and ceremony you know to to mark it all and uh, uh, yes it's, I'm looking forward to it Oh, that's so excellent. Wow. When when is so that's like coming up in later on this year then in like summertime? Uh no, one tomorrow and then one in May. Oh, excellent. Oh my god, it's so close. That's so yeah, yeah. excellent. Wow. So, I, 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 they're, they're having them they have graduations at all manner of different times for PhD students because they're not mm. in the standard year of the undergraduate. So our big graduation ceremony is is, is tends to be in November. So yeah. it's until um, rather have them in the summer following they, they leave until November. It's a thing that Chester does. But no, for these ones, these are these are people who graduate, you know, got through last year. And this is their graduate, their formal graduation is, is, is now. Don't ask me. Part of it is COVID delays, um, I think. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, now they are. At, this is the first time they've been able to get back in the cathedral. That's so awesome. Well, I'm really glad for them. And I hope that it is a day that they can remember because it is a really big step for people and and I really hope that they can do everything that they want to do with it and you know maybe go into academia or not or whatever they want it's really in, awesome in a lectureship but um, um and the other one I think is I don't know exactly the details of what they're doing at the moment but uh, yeah, yeah. times hopefully <laughs> perfect oh it's really nice to hear and like yeah I do appreciate you sharing your experience with your PhD and like um, you not just your experiences, but your advices on how to, you know, become a better student for it or a better lecturer or anything like that of the like, really. Um, and I just want to ask, yeah, do you have like any, I guess, final comments about your PhD or about struggling through it or anything of that kind of? Um, you. I, no, I don't really. I think I've said everything I want to say other than thank you so much for showing the interest and thank you so much for having this conversation because it's you'd think it'd be the first thing people want to talk about. But actually, whether it's on this venue or anywhere else, no one wants to talk about the PhDs with you know, more established lecturers who 
had yes. uh, they, they graduated a while ago. There's lots of anxieties, lots of discussions on social media about the the failings and troubles of these 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 uh, of being a postgraduate researcher. And I I think those conversations are not new, but equally are, are no, never been more important. But equally, um, those that've been through it need to tell their stories, and they'll all have different perspectives and different takes. But I would say um, it'll always be a unique journey. <laughs> and, yes. uh, you have to be forgiving to yourself, but also you can't um, export the blame for your choices to everybody else at the same time. It's got to be somewhere in between. And to to you, this is your choice to do a doctoral piece of research, whether mm -hmm. you're funding or you do it independently. And um, it'll never go as you anticipate. Um, but, you know, you can't anticipate exactly what will go happen. Um, but at, at some point, you've got to be forgiving to yourself, but also take ownership of it and uh, get the help when you need, um, get the guidance when you, you, you expect it, um, mm. learn things of your supervisors, so. but but you can't yeah. make it their fault unless it is you know, some exceptional circumstance. You, it's something that you've just got to um, try and get through or stop. And I think the other yeah. point is um, there's no shame on mental health grounds or on physical health grounds or on financial grounds. If you can't complete what you started, it's not the end of the world. And I think there's a lot of pressures on people to to go on and on and on to the bitter end, no matter the, the, the mental, financial, physical hardship it brings. No, it's only a, it's only a qualification. It's, it, it, yeah. it, it, we put it on a pedestal because it's the, elite, the, the highest piece of qualification you can get at the UK university. But at the end of the day, health and sanity are more important absolutely yeah yeah no I mean I totally agree with you I'm sitting here without without a PhD but I agree with you <laughs> you're very compelling <laughs> no it's, and it's... and please don't thank me for showing an interest I do I agree with you in that I think that a lot of the time um new students come and go um, in your university and no one ever thinks about or asks about oh well what did you write for your PhD and what did you do and it seems like such a long time ago but it's actually really interesting to see how people get to where they are at the moment and I guess it kind of is the beginning of your academic career whether or not it is the reason that you're in the position that you're in um, it really just sets you up for that and thank you for talking about it and I really appreciated it because I I love talking to you you know I do um, <laughs> it's always so interesting to hear about a life that I wasn't a part of so I know you as Howard the lecturer I don't know you as the PhD student who cl like climbed his way up and I think it's really impressive so thank you so much for sharing it and I'm sorry if um you know I asked questions that you were not ready for oh, that's all right. it's all good it's all part of the fun we've done we're not doing any sort of formulaic thing are we and uh, hopefully we can have a chat about something else in the future let's uh, let's yeah. talk random archaeology <laughs> yeah, let's try. I think it'll be lots of fun. And um, I hope that anyone who's listening can enjoy um, not just this one, but the many more to come. So, yeah, excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs>